Hey, wow. How are you guys doing? St. Thomas, London, Ontario. Is that about right? Yes, yeah, pretty sir. close. <laughs> Nate and Greg's world. Uh, Nate and Greg are fantastic podcasters here in Canada. And they are actually people who are living an experience that are about making a difference in people's lives. They want to have face-to-face -face conversations. They want to have an impact. Yet they want to have real conversations. Would that be an accurate way to describe your podcast and a little bit about you guys? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. Um, like our, our big thing with the podcast itself is trying to have uh, real diversity because it's so often right now that everyone keeps going saying, oh, well, diversity is setting up a, a thing where we have so many people of this culture, so many people of this culture or the race or religion and stuff like that. And if you think or think a certain way, then that's wrong. You can't think like that. You need to think like this so that we can all be diverse. Well, that's not what Nate and I both agree on. We, we, we agree, agree that, you know, you think what you want to think, we think what we want to think. And as long as we can have an understanding that, you know, this is the way everybody is, then that's what real diversity is. Being able to have an understanding of what other people believe and see and the difference in backgrounds, but still being able to come together at the end to get a job done. That's real diversity. And Greg, you had experience in the Middle East where you had probably one of the widest diversities. Like you think about Canada where we have so many people from all different countries and then you go to Saudi where I guess your experience there would have been totally, totally a new world. It, it, it very much was. Um, I was basically a third class citizen there. Um, but even still, I didn't even have it as bad off as um, any of the um, foreign national uh, workers that were there. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, Filipinos, we had um, uh, people from Taiwan and Thailand and stuff like that. And those guys were completely treated completely like garbage as, as far as i'm concerned it was absolute slave labor yes it really was um even though they're getting paid mm -hmm. you know but they're getting paid very very minimal and then having to sleep all in the same room for the long period of time you know and then they're working their butt off all day long you know like just because you're getting money don't mean you're not a slave <laughs> and your empathy or your compassion, did it make a dramatic shift while you were there or did you actually have that before you went? Um, I had it before I went. I had it before I went. Um, like as a perfect example, we had uh, the group of cleaners that came into our office the one day and we had a Saudi that was actually in our office as well. And the Saudis tend to treat them extremely poorly. And we're always excited when they come in because they're like, oh, here we come in, we clean up for you, you know, so it is. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. Well, here, let me help. I'll move this stuff out of the way at least and do all this stuff. So you go and you do all that. And then I had the Saudi in the back going, yes, you come, you clean this, you clean this, go, 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 go. And I'm, I finally said, okay, guys, you're done. Have a good day. Get out. Oh, but we're not done cleaning. And the Saudi's like, yes, they need to clean. I'm like, no, they're done cleaning. You know, until you can be nice to them, I'm not letting you have them come in to clean for you. So you're not letting them be abused. Not no, on your, not no. on your shift. No. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Nate, you, you're a therapist, if I'm not mistaken, and you've worked with people. So building a bridge with somebody who's had such a different background or different experience, what is one or two ways that you bring empathy into that type of conversation or that type of experience? Well, actually, I mean, I've had, uh, I was diagnosed with mental health issues when I was in grade six. Uh, it was the first time I was hospitalized um of many times so i have a lot of understanding of uh you know i i guess i have a lot of understanding for different people i was also raised to understand that everybody has value um and everybody needs to be respected treated treated right and everybody has an opinion right and everybody should be able to express their opinion i mean i think that's part of what's living in north america canada is is that we have that freedom and what I see, you know, as we were talking about the podcast earlier, mm -hmm. what I see now is it's okay to have certain opinions, but other opinions, if you have those, it makes you a horrible person or a bad person. Even if you have questions, it can make you a bad person. So 
that's part of it is breaking down that that barrier because it's like we say in the podcast it's a very small percentage of people that feel that way but they're the loudest people and we all know the old saying that the squeaky wheel gets the oil absolutely and the problem is is that all these screamers this small percentage of people that are screaming and so angry about whatever they're angry about are having policy changes made and they're they're changing the way we do things and the way we allow things to happen in in Canada um and I don't, you know, I guess trying to, you know, spread light on it that, you know, mm-hmm. somebody might be a jerk because of their opinion, but it's still their opinion. They're allowed to have that opinion. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, a lot of people fought and died for that ability for people to have opinions. Right. And that's part of the beauty of the country we live in. Mm-hmm. And so as you guys move forward with the podcast, I, 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 we've been meaning to have some more face-to-face and uh, have, have discussions, uh, unity and diversity conversations, and, and actually mm-hmm. encourage people to say what they say. Because often when they say it, they get a, even a new distinction or a new way of even looking at it. And then if you respect yeah. them and you ask a question, they actually can have a shift. And so... Well, exactly. For sure. Well, you remember how it, like a lot of people that we, where we met you at that, uh, that the whatever... Wrapped in startup. Yep. Startup, thank you. Yeah, my mind, it's it's the coronavirus. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, when we went there, like the way a lot of people saw me and Greg when we first sure. were in the room, right? Absolutely. You know, very burly, dirty, ugly. Yeah. You know, people were wondering if they're in the right place, right? Or what the hell was going well, on. Well, it comes across again, if, if the feedback would be is again, you guys simply look like a couple of bikers. Yeah. You know, uh, Which yeah. is good because we are. So. And, 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 <laughs> and then most people then take it to Hell's Angels and then they think of, of drug dealers and then they think of deviants that way. Yet, if yeah. you've ever talked to people, the fact that you have a masculine look, that you're a Grizzly Adams type of guy. Yeah. Like that's what, I think Grizzly Adams was probably one of the greatest things for people with beards and mustaches, I think, is that yep. they found somebody who actually had a heart for animals and a heart for nature. And yeah. that's what... Uh, once you get over your own record of, of projection, then well, you yeah, have a the conversation. Whole thing, you know, yeah. 10, 15 minutes into that workshop, everybody realized that we were just cuddly bears. Yeah. That were, <laughs> that were ridiculous. Yeah. Right? And just and you got a sense so of humor. Up, yeah. And yeah. just, you know, we're good people. And we're just trying to bring that out that, you know, people need to stop judging people based on their looks, based on their beliefs, based on their opinions. Yeah. And as, you know, Greg says, like, we can still get together and do a job at the end of the day, even though if we don't agree. In mm-hmm. fact, I'll sit down and break bread with somebody I don't necessarily agree with. Mm-hmm. Right? You'll probably have some of the greatest conversations because if you ask them their thoughts, you'll, you'll get such an illumination as opposed to what you think about where they're at. They'll tell you a whole new story that probably is not even in your reality of understanding. Yeah, well, and sometimes I might change my mind a little bit too. Yeah. Yes. Like there, there's there's been many conversations that Nate and I have had, and like on on the podcast, most of the subjects that we've had, um, we tend to both really agree on, but there's certain aspects of it that we don't agree on. And then we've had other conversations away from the podcast that you know he, he has a certain opinion about certain items, and I don't want to get into it because we're hoping to bring him up on podcasts mm, at some sure. point that I just don't agree with, just like there's certain opinions that I have that he just does not agree with. But yeah. if we can't get together to do a podcast and talk about this stuff, we're, we're no different than these people that are out there yelling and screaming that, no, you have to change your mind to think this way so we can have diversity. Well, that's what's that's really not, great. That's not real diversity. That's really great about what you guys are doing because as you share topics that probably have never even talked to anyone about, it's it's such yeah. a revealing and, and – a vulnerable component. I wanted to go into your own dialogue with yourself because so much of mental illness is about the dialogue with oneself that is so attacking, so harsh, so brutal. And what can one do to, again, either one of you is just share a little bit about calming or taming that, that inner demon that tends to pop up on occasions. Um, well, I know for myself, um, I, I really struggled with it. Um, I was diagnosed with PTSD back in the late 2000s um, from my time in uh, the military. And um, 
it, it, it hit me really rough. Um, I actually went and spent some time up in Guelph at Homewood there uh, with their PTSR program. And they taught me a lot of really cool uh, tools, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. to, you know, start working with and, you know, stuff like that. You know, simple stuff like just, you know, some self-meditation, just try to sit there, completely zone out, just, you know, with, like breathing techniques, you know count in for or breathe in for a count of five hold for a count of five breathe out for a count of five you know that type of thing um some of it was other types of distractions where you know you go and just start painting sometimes it's a matter of painting how you're feeling or just painting something else and i i'm not i'm not overly uh into the whole flower power hippie stuff that uh, that's not me but let me tell you while i was there i was trying all this flower power hippie stuff and it was working it was fantastic and there, there's times where i've had to use it um uh luckily for myself um i was on medication when i went to homewood but by the time i left homewood i was able to be off the medication mm -hmm. which was a major goal for me because i just don't like meds and stuff like that um i smoke like a chimney um but i don't drink a whole lot and I, I just, I just don't do the drugs. I really don't. It's just not for me. Um, but uh, I was able to still work using tools like that, you know, and it really helped me out for like a good number of years. And it, it wasn't until I think it was last year, maybe the year before, I can't quite remember. Yeah, the year before, um, uh, I suddenly hit a low spot and that was from basically being isolated by myself in Saudi with nothing but my thoughts going on in my head. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had to call a doctor just to bounce things off of, you know, and get a little direction, you know, here, why don't you put your thoughts this way? Why don't you put your thoughts this way? Mm -hmm. Okay. I can start doing that. And sometimes for myself, um, it's a matter of just accepting what I feel. You know, as opposed to, I don't want to feel like this. You know, let me stop feeling like this. Instead of doing that, just go, nope. Sometimes I need to feel like this. Let me feel it. Let me get through it. And it'll all be done and over with. And yeah. that's awesome. Because again, that, that conversation, as opposed to being the self-critic, you actually, if you engage a real, an emotion, it, it actually can teach us some wonderful lessons. Yeah. Instead of resisting, and there's a common phrase, whatever you resist will persist. So as opposed to resisting it, you actually can bring it in and mm -hmm. feel it, experience it in a new way, and then perhaps let it go. Yeah. Um, well, you, guess, talk about, you talk about the demons. Yes. Right? And I always say the first step is to understand that those demons are there and they're never going anywhere. Correct. Right? Like people, I think the first thing, the hardest part is grasping the fact that those demons I guess, which is a great way of saying it, but those mental health issues, those issues you have, you're having, they're not going away. No. They're going to be there. Yep. Right. And that's that first part of acceptance, accepting that. And like Greg says, like saying, yeah, I, this is what I'm feeling. Right. Mm -hmm. And not trying to think about why I'm feeling like this or, you know, this whole going through what the hell is wrong with me. My life isn't that bad, but yet I'm feeling like this. Why do I feel like this? Stop trying to answer those questions right? Don't try to make it right. Don't try to understand it. Just accept it. Understand that it's going to be there no matter what, right? So it's like that metaphor where you got the, the nice angel and the, the little angel with the pick for it. Both there. It's, just, it's going to be there probably until the day we do walk through whatever we walk through. And it's yeah, funny, sure. But it'll be nice if both of them can be, there's a term called equanimity, is that neither one of them's got a lot of energy around you because whatever one you give the more energy to, it uh, it creates this battle of right or wrong as opposed yeah. to right or left. Yeah. And then I think the next part of it is is just being honest with yourself. I mean, I think so many people lack that. I don't think people have the ability to truly be honest with themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we they talked about that meditation place mm -hmm. where you pay for 14 days. And I think that's part of it is you start to face that honesty that you're able to bury most of the time. And it's hard to, it's hard to face honesty. Mm -hmm. The truth of your life and who you are and what you have. And, you know, the fact that there's reasons why you are where you're at. And I, I can give a great fucking example for that. Um, 
when I first came home from Afghanistan on the one tour, um, I knew I was having issues. I knew I needed to get some help. So I went in, I started getting help. Well, then I started talking to the one doctor there and I talked to her, I think it was every other week or something like that. And every time I went in to see her, she'd be like, okay, well, Greg, how's things going? And I'm like, oh, good. You know, and she's like, okay, well, what about this? What about this? Yeah, yeah, no, no, there's a little bit about this, but that's all right. And this went on for about a year of me just going, and, yeah, things are fine. You know, just still not quite sleeping right, but, you know, hey, you know, things are the way they are. Well, then it just so happened that right before I went in to see her the one day, something went down at work. I don't even remember what it was, but it set me right off. And my, my PTSD just ramped way up. And, uh, I was extremely angry, extremely angry. Like I was ready to like drive my car or an armored vehicle through a building just to prove a point. Right. And I went in to go see her and I'm just going off on her. And she's like, Whoa, 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 what's going on? And I'm like, this is what's going on. Blah, blah, blah. She's like, okay, wait a second. You know, like, is this something new? And I'm like, no, this is the way it is all the fucking time. And she's like, Oh really? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, why haven't you said this before? And suddenly I realized that I'd been basically downplaying everything that I'd been going through for that entire year. So that was a year wasted on getting proper therapy, where mm -hmm. if I'd just come out and said, look, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. This is how I'm feeling. You know, give me that stepping stone to move forward, to do what I got to do. Then I might not have been in as bad of a situation as I was definitely not that day. Mm -hmm. you know and um so right from there uh the unfortunate part she was actually leaving she was posted somewhere else and she's like okay well you got to make sure you talk to your doctors about this and i'm like okay <laughs> and right from there it, it didn't matter somebody asked me so what's going on well let me tell you and <laughs> i tell them absolutely everything you know and sometimes they get a lot more details than what they were really wanting or expecting right and so that's, uh, that's having an authentic conversation. That's truly yeah. saying what you feel and, and actually allowing your feelings to have a voice as opposed to suppressing them, as opposed to resisting, mm -hmm. as opposed to self-filtering. It's really allowing yourself to be uh, naked, vulnerable, yeah. to be expressive. Uh, yeah. Do you see a lot of that in, in the counseling or in the therapy that you're doing, Nate? Everybody's different. I mean, that's another huge thing is, you know, we have to start looking at everybody as individuals. One size matter. does not fit all. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter if you're from a specific group, a specific race, a specific, specific religion. Everybody's still an individual. Everybody thinks differently, acts differently, whatever, feels differently, right? Um, so with counseling, I find everybody's different. It takes people, some, some people it takes a long time to break those barriers down and to get honesty out of them um i'm i'm a very i guess hard ass counselor in the way that i don't if i see bullshit i call it and i try to drive people to be honest because i really feel like that honesty needs to come out mm -hmm. before any work can get done because if i'm you know it's like if a doctor is just treating symptoms but not treating what's actually wrong with the the, the patient they're not going to necessarily get healthy right so um same thing if i'm dealing with this person saying this is their issues but really that's the very surface and not deep i'm band-aiding everything right it's never going to happen but everybody has a different timeline like i have some clients where the first time i talk to them they tell me their whole life story and then right. some more yes right and i'm like whoa like <laughs> wow right and then other people were like it takes months so everybody's a different pace everybody's different mm -hmm. as we are uh, dealing with uh, covid right now and both of you are again obviously experiencing it differently what what's covid teaching you right now or what's your experience and is there a vulnerability that either one or both of you are experiencing i don't think it's you know what i'll tell you something and this is might make me sound like i don't want to sound okay <laughs> i say a lot of shit that makes me sound like i don't want to sound <laughs> okay but i will say this Okay, I think the only thing that the COVID-19 has done for me is it secured me in the understanding that everything can fall apart in the snap of a finger. Yes. 
all this stability and safety and all this shit we have is so fake. Not, and I'm not saying that it's necessarily that it's not needed or it's not good that we have it at times, but I think it just has solidified the fact that shit can fall apart in a day. Mm -hmm. Like this is, this is all pretend. It's all smoke and mirrors, mm -hmm. right? In India, they call it Maya. It's an illusion. Yeah. So, so what you think you need, what you think is important, there's an illusion. There's a story. Ever. You've created it. Right. You don't, yeah. you don't need a lot of the things you think you need. Or the things that you think you're always going to have. Right. Yeah. It's just always going to be there. Like so you're always going to have toilet paper. Apparently not because the is. floors are still empty. Yeah, that's absolutely. Right. But I think that's about what it's really summed up for me is, yeah. you know, even though I knew it, I think this has really made that a solid thing with me. So has that helped you with stress? Is that given you some added perspectives that you don't have as much of an attachment to things? Or what ways do you think that that new distinction is going to serve you? Um, I don't know, because I've never had it. Atta I think attachment to family, I have an attachment to friends. I've never been the type of person that's attached to things, right. objects, belongings. Like, I don't, I've never had that. I can be with a house. I can be without a house. I can be with, I mean, I can be happy with whatever I own. Right. That doesn't mean I want to give it up tomorrow. <laughs> not saying that either, right? But if it did disappear, it, to me, it wouldn't be the end. But you're not losing any sleep. You're not having any insomnia. You're not worried about uh, some of the side effects of the financial or knock-on effects that uh, it might trigger? You know how many, I have fucking face financial hardship so many times in my life right i've lived on the streets i've you know i no I, I don't have fear i have a bit of fear when it comes to my kids i don't want my kids right to have to deal with some shit but at the same time i mean i can't control that right. i worry more about the old people in my life right. my parents people like that are at the age where they're vulnerable and you know they live in cities yes and if they get it the chances of them surviving is not great very good. And how about you, uh, Greg? What's uh, what's been a lesson or two that you've taken from the last uh, couple of months? Um, well, the, the one thing for me is, you know, kind of along what Nate was saying there, that there are people that are just not ready. Like, if this really was like a zombie apocalypse, Walking Dead situation, there, you know, there you can very very clearly see that there are people that are just out for themselves, you know. Now, mind you, there are quite a few people that are actually out to help the other people. Um, great story that I heard, which actually goes really well with, you know, the podcast and the not taking things at, at face value. There was um, a Meals on Wheels uh, center that they went and they suddenly lost half their drivers because of this whole coronavirus. Well, the one of the local biker groups ended up finding out about this and we're not talking, you know, your, your friendly biker groups, we'll right. say, sure. right. Um, they heard that, you know, suddenly there's all these people that were not getting their meals because there was nobody there. So they all rolled up the one day and said, hi, we're here to help. Let yeah. us know, yeah. you know, and they went out and they did stuff. So sometimes the people that you don't expect to be selfish are actually the selfish ones. Whereas the ones that you would expect to be selfish and just out for themselves are the ones that are actually going to come through. Right. You know, um, like I, I've seen a lot of evidence of that lately. Um, as I said, I, like I was at the grocery store just what yesterday or something like that. And the toilet paper roll or toilet paper aisle is still empty. Right. And it's like, are, are, are you really crapping your pants that much? Right. You know, like it, 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 it's unbelievable. And everybody laughs about the toilet paper thing, but I think it's also an insight into how we are as, as animals in survival. Absolutely. The fact that we don't worry about other people. Yeah. You know, everybody wants it all. I, I need it all. I don't care if other people go without. Right. Same with hand sanitizers, masks, yeah. you know, all that stuff. You know, like this is such a small thing. And like Greg said, if it was, if shit really hit the fan, are we going to be there for each other? <laughs> no. I don't think we will. We're animals, right? It's survival. 
It's all it is. Fear factor. When fear factor comes in, the reptilian mind tends to take over, and and we're gonna we'll likely see more of it, yeah, less than uh, than less of it. Yet we do, like you say, we are also seeing some good things do come from people that uh, mm-hmm. may surprise us. And I think that's one of the things. But your podcast is really teaching is that don't judge the book by its cover. No, um, offer some opportunities, but also be a, yeah. be a leading a light for service and, and contribution yeah and like w- w- one of the big things you know that we found too like with our podcast it you know we both agreed right at the beginning that we're going to take the hit for the rest of the dumb white guys out there right um because there are certain questions that you can't ask other races or people of different religions and stuff like that because they've been deemed as being um some kind of an ist or phobic of something, right? We have absolutely no problem asking those questions because we make sure our guests understand, listen, we're going to be asking these questions. We like to call them our asshole questions, right. you know? So we want to ask them so that we can get the answer, right? Um, a great example of that, and it's still one that I love today, is we had our friend Deborah on, and she's a black lady. And we went, we asked her, so is it true that black people like fried chicken and watermelon? You know, and she's like, absolutely, who doesn't? You know, <laughs> and it was great because if I just gone up to any black person out there on the street and said, you know, like, do you guys really like fried chicken and watermelon? And I'm being sincere, mm. I might get beat up, yeah. right? And not because they're black, okay? Let's be very clear on that. It's because that's an, apparently an offensive thing to ask nowadays, you know, but how can we, how can it be offensive if you're, if you're trying to know the truth, mm-hmm. you know? And I think some of it too is with those questions is we're trying to get out there just how ridiculous some of the stuff is, you know, right. When you hear it in, you know, in the context that we put it out in, like I'm hoping that for some people it kind of rattles their brains a little bit. Like, Oh, that really is stupid. Mm -hmm. It's it's funny because you can rattle it that way too. Like it's beautiful if you can rattle that self introspection. It's ridiculous, and then you can also rattle it with a little bit of humor, which is also a great diffuser. And it's something that you guys are both very gifted at, also. So Mm -hmm. that's the component that I'm looking to to even infuse in everything I'm about. Right, is try to bring some humor into it. That some of our perspectives, some of our beliefs, even my own inner demons right if you can make that demon and put him on his skirt and put him in like with a hula hoop as opposed to a pitchfork it it lightens it up a whole lot right like with myself with ptsd right i have no problem going up to people and saying hi how you doing you know by the way i'm crazy and i have the papers to prove it exactly right you know (laughs) i I like making fun of myself like i know i'm not crazy right (laughs) Because the papers do tell me that I'm not crazy. But. <laughs> you you you, you like, can have a tendency towards that direction. Yes, like we, we I, all I was, do. Yeah, when, when when I was at, at Homewood, you know, there was a few of us on the floor that we really enjoyed the humor aspect of it and making fun of ourselves. Yes. Um, and so we went out the one day and we went to Dairy Queen and I decided, well, you know what, I'm getting a big ice cream cake for everybody <laughs> that's on the floor. So I went and I picked it up. And they're like, oh, would you like anything written on it? And I'm like, yep, right to all my crazy friends. Absolutely. Well, we went, we brought it back. And uh, I'm like, hey, everybody in the nut house, come on right. over here. We're going to have some ice cream cake. Well, the nurses went off going, you can't call it a nut house. And then yeah. they saw what was written on the cake and they lost their mind. They're like, oh, you're going to offend so many people. I'm like, well, if I do, I do. You know, that's their problem. Yeah. Well, laughter is a great healer. I, I, it's, have you got a story about laughter being a healer at all, Nate? Because it's something that in my book and in this chapter, uh, I'm really encouraging people who are going through stress or going through uh, hardship or insomnia is to find something funny about it or humorous about it. Any uh, little story about that there, Nate, that you might have? I don't know if I have stories, but like, I, you know, I'm sure I have a hundred. I just can't think of anything right now. But but it's true. Like, I mean, you have to have humor. You have to be able to laugh at yourself. You have to have the ability to laugh at others. It's one of the greatest healers, right? I remember that series. I don't know if you knew that series of books. It was a cartoon illustrator. So it's like laughter is the best medicine. Absolutely. And it's true. It's the absolute best medicine for everybody. Yeah. And when we start taking away people's ability to laugh, it makes everything so much harder, yeah. you know? 
Yeah, laughter actually, I've taught laughter yoga and I've been a fan of laughter yoga. And it's like, if you do 10 minutes of laughter yoga, 10 minutes of laughing is like running three to five kilometer. It's just, it's oh, hard yeah. to laugh that long. And it's, yeah. it is a great uh, way to release, move the body, to get yourself letting go of some of the hardness or strictness of what you're focused on. So, yeah, yeah. exactly. I'd like Jenna, bring up the, the session to a close and just asking you again, when we bring back to PTSD or, or depression, what would be one thing that you'd like this to listeners today to have? It's something I'm, I might quote you and put it in the chapter because again, I, I wanted to acknowledge you guys in, in the chapter in the book. Uh, I want people when they read it, they'll also go visit your podcast because many of the things that you're doing with diversity and conversation, unity and diversity are things that I'm really really passionate about also and it's just it's another great way to to share something that might be dear dear to your heart or to a personal experience yeah um for, for myself um especially after having gone through uh that one year of not telling my doctor the truth of what was going on um be honest with yourself be honest with yourself what are you feeling what are you what's going on in your head? You know, what are your thoughts? What are your feelings? And you know what? Uh, bring it out. Let people know. You know, don't hold it in. Let people know right away. And if they don't like it, that's their problem. You know, get out what you need to get out. You know, don't be destructive about it, but let people know, this is how I'm seeing, this is how I'm feeling. It, it's it's worse to hold it in. And when people ask you, how are you feeling? Just saying fine. It's not fine. Very good. <laughs> you got, you got to be honest with yourself. Don't be embarrassed about what you're going through. Let people know, Beautiful. get the help. Yep. Very good. I think that's the key too, is be willing to get help, ask for help. Mm -hmm. It's such a key component of, of bravery of being courageous. So, mm -hmm. and how about you, Nate? Well, I think if you're asking about mental health, I think the biggest thing that I would get out to people is stop sitting and trying to figure out how you're going to live with the disease. Figure out your life with the disease. Nice. Very good distinction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a part of your fullness. It's a part of your full life experience. It's not something that uh, you can cut We're out. Either. If you cut it out, it's just going to grow back likely, right? It's right. Mm -hmm. Demon's always there. Yeah. No. Until the day we, yep. I, Very I, good, guys. I, I, I had one guy actually go and tell me, you know, oh, no, don't worry about the, the whole PTSD thing there. You can just get over it. And I'm like, no, no. I, I might be able to get some healing and mm. stuff like this, but it's like being an alcoholic, okay? Just because you stop drinking, don't mean you're, it doesn't mean you're not an alcoholic still, mm -hmm. okay? That one drink is going to put you back over the edge. Right. You know, it's always going to be there. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. I'm going to bring this to a close. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.